credibility is part of that certainty. So if I come up to you and we're talking whatever your business is and you're, you're there, you're at my office and you're there to sell me X, whatever X, it doesn't matter. So the question is, is why do I believe this person is credible or not? W what is going to happen? How do we increase that credibility level? How do you get to the point where I can be certain that he's certain? What's your name? Green shirt? Brett. Brett? Yep. Brett, okay. So how, how could I know that Brett's competent and certain and credible in his field? There's a few things that you have to have. The first thing is, is I have to observe competence, okay? I have to observe Brett's competence. That means he's going to have to show me something in his presentation that I don't know, okay? That's how you demonstrate competence. So, for example, Brett's coming in and he's going to communicate something to me early in his presentation, his communication with me, influencing me and whatever I've got to buy. And he's got to show me, I have to observe that he's competent. So that means he's got to either A, know something about me, Hey, Kev, I saw that you wrote Psychology per Persuasion. Hey, Kev, I saw that you wrote Science of Influence. Uh, hey, Kev, I saw your website uh, about your article about uh, rejection and resistance this week and you know, harness harnessing um, uh, resentment and stuff like that. For example, now all of a sudden I know he's competent because he's obviously he's smart because he knows something about me, right? He has to be intelligent, right? So therefore, he did some homework and he's demonstrated that. But there's another way that you can demonstrate competence too, and that's to actually show me something that I didn't know before. This is a pretty good tool. So one of the things that I like to do is if I'm giving a presentation to, to get further business, like if I'm giving a presentation today and I want to get further business from this specific group of people, like Auntie Anne's, for example, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate three things. I'm, boom, boom, boom. I'm going to show them three tools and three ways that they can implement that information that they have never seen before. Okay, Three things that are relevant to whatever we're here for to talk about today. And then, so Elliot, teaches influence and body language, Roberto teaches body language or influence. And so they can teach three things that I don't and that aren't online, that aren't easily acceptable to the person who's sitting right here, to Tim. And now all of a sudden, Tim can sit there and watch Elliot go, oh my gosh, that is cool. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Wow, that is really neat. Cool, cool, cool. So I've observed competence. I've actually learned something today without it being shoved at me as in an arrogant way, which by the way, these guys are amazing at. So that's a cool way you can observe competence. The other is to be told from a significant person. So if, like the other day, Elliot, um, somebody called Elliot from, what was the, what was the channel that, who was who it that called us? Do you remember that, the, uh, the TV show? Yeah. The History Channel, that's what it was. So I never remember these. So anyway, the History Channel wanted uh, uh, somebody who does nonverbal communication research and, and uh, does a lot of presentations on it. They wanted to see if, if Elliot could do a gig for them. Elliot couldn't do a gig, so he forwarded them over to me. He says, well, he says, if you can't do me, you know. No, he just, he just says he couldn't do it. So he just says, well, you should probably call Kevin Hogan, right? And so, so the very fact that they found Elliot and they determined that Elliot would be the best person for their History Channel gig, whatever the show was, and why they thought that, I have no idea. But whatever. So, but Elliot then, he passes the person to me, all right? That's pretty huge, right? I'm Elliot's competitor out there in the real world. If, I, if he gets the gig, I don't get it, right? But we're also best friends, right? So, so he passes it over to me. That referral carries huge weight. And so I, we made a, our demo video, and we sent it off to the History Channel. My, I suspected that the show wouldn't air. I don't think it ever did. Um, but that's how you do it, is you refer, you get the referral from somebody who is unbiased, who has no vested interest in the outcome of the deal, okay? Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness is important. Trustworthiness, trustworthiness is important. It's not as important as dependability. Dependability is on time. So let's just have this conversation here real quick. Trustworthiness is valuable. Dependability is four times as valuable. Okay? Dependability is the absolute guarantee without a shadow of a doubt that person X will arrive when they say that they will arrive. If you arrive always, 100% of the time, at the time that you say that you're going to arrive, people are certain about you. They are positive about you. When people are late, they are not trustworthy, period. It's that simple. So you can take all of the credibility, you can take all of the other stuff that you put out there in brochures and business cards and cool website, and if you're five minutes late, you strip that time away from me, I don't have five seconds, 
I might listen to you for five minutes, but it's over. There's just zero chance. Dependability, way important, more important than trustworthiness, but trustworthiness does matter after dependability. Two things are relevant, likable and competence. Likeability is not necessary for trust. You don't have to like the guy, the plumber, that comes in and does the plumbing in the house, right? You need a guy who's, he can be a jerk, but if he stops the, the thing from running, it's fine, right? Okay, so you don't have to be likable, but it helps get to trustworthiness. And competence is a big part of that trustworthiness puzzle as well. Also, if you want to be seen as competent and credible, you need to have other orientation. There are the narcissists. This is about me today. It's all about me. It's always about me. After all, I'm, I'm all that matters, isn't it? And so as long as my comfort needs are met, I'm happy with that. And that's good. And I'm really glad that you guys are here. But my comfort needs are being met over here. That makes you feel real good inside, doesn't it, Tim? So all of a sudden, right now, oh, it doesn't, right. So other orientation is what people use as a criteria for trustworthiness. That's pretty monstrous. Pretty monstrous. Think about it. You ever hear that? There's a book. Some idiot wrote a book one time. Not that he's a bad guy, just a moron. But, but uh, it was called The Disease to Please. The Disease to Please. And I thought, oh, so let me see if I understand this. People who please other people are bad, and people who don't please other people are good. That would be, by definition, narcissism. So the person who wrote this book about himself is a narcissist, and we now have lots of people reading this book that we should all be like that, except for one thing. We don't trust people who are self-focused. We only trust people who are other-focused, other-focused. I walk into your office thing and I say, so, hey, nice to see you. How am I looking today? Do I look great? Huh? <laughs> looking good today? Do you like this? You got like the ring man and I got this purple shirt. You know I'm wearing purple? Because last time I saw Roberto wear purple and I wanted to look as good as Roberto did on stage. Do you know that? And it's like, boy, and then about an hour and a half later I get to you, right? Other focus is the whole deal with trustworthiness. If you have that other focus, people will know that you matter. In fact, other focus is all that ultimately matters, because if you don't have it, everything else falls through and people will not trust you, all right, period. <laughs>